I'm Martin Lowry. I'm the ICA board member from the United States, and we're looking forward to a very wonderful uh, closing plenary session. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to once again congratulate the two Rochdale Pioneer awardees, Howard Brodsky from the United States and Mr. Kim from Korea. Uh, well deserved for both of them, and I thought both of them gave a uh, wonderful acceptance speech last night. Very, very inspiring. Also, I want to remind you that for voting delegates, you need to register and go to, to, go to registration area for your uh, papers. You can do that at any time during the lunch period, and that's right outside uh, beyond security uh, in this building. So we welcome you. And by the way, uh, James is here. Great. Okay. Welcome, James. Um, this is a panel on peace and security and the relationship of those two ideas to cooperatives. It's, an, it's one that I hope we all can learn a lot from uh, and be very proud of in terms of the role of cooperatives historically. Um, I think you'll find as we get into the presentation that peace is not simply the opposite of war or the abs absence of conflict. It's got much more to do with the overall theme of this conference, which is development and the role of economic development in stabilizing economies, stabilizing societies, and bringing people closer together. We've had some very inspiring talks in previous plenary sessions about the unique difference that we make as cooperatives because we are fundamentally about people and people-centered policies and decisions. Um, as we get into the General Assembly this afternoon and we start talking about the future and looking out toward the 2030 uh, time frame for the Sustainable Development Goals, all of this is really interrelated as to the role that cooperatives can play in fundamentally transforming society into a world that is for everyone and everyone prospers. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Claudia Sanchez Bajo. She is a fellow researcher at the University of Buenos Aires on the Faculty of Economics. She is a guest professor at University of Cassel, visiting scholar at the LBJ, that is Lyndon Baines Johnson, former U.S. President, the LBJ uh, School of Public Affairs uh, at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, she's the inaugural, inaugural chair of the Cooperative Enterprises Faculty of Business and Economics at the University of Winnipeg in Canada and is focused in a lot of her research and writing on the relationship of co-ops to the future of work and the dignity of work, as well as the role of cooperatives in creating peaceful societies. So please welcome Claudia Sanchez Bajo. Hello, good morning to everybody. I'm Akuru. So I have a PowerPoint. Let's see if it's working. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, okay, good. So the interest uh, in connecting cooperatives and peace is uh, becoming quite important uh, in the 21st century. And uh, there is a development report, for example, from the World Bank in 2011 that has uh, said uh, that violence now is breaking the patterns of the 21st century with many more subnational areas falling into conflict violent conflict and with more repeated cycles of violence whereby we think we are arriving to stability and uh, those areas fall back into violence within five years. And this is, uh, should make us think further how we can contribute to create stable prosperity and uh, a peaceful living economy for all. 
The first thing that comes to mind, actually, is not really peace. But when we talk of peace nowadays, we think it's merely the absence, or most importantly, the absence of violence, which, of course, is essential to life and to all of us. And this really uh, became um, the mainstream thinking from the 17th century forward. The key ideas is that the sovereign actually is the one to ensure peace, so it's a top-down um, security. And also the importance of law uh, from Grotius in the 17th century in the Netherlands. However, there is an S lacking there, all languages. In the beginning, the concept of peace in languages all around the world, Amahoro, Shalom, but also in the English language, Fried or Sib, in Germanic languages, Hoping uh, in Chinese, and so on, actually meant much more than that. Meant, meant happiness, prosperity, welfare, well-being, inner peace, uh, cohesion, harmony, and so on. Nowadays, this I'm going to show you just two maps of statistics uh, around the world of 2019. So this is the current situation in terms of fragility in the world. We uh, that uh, what we find we see in blue are the most sustainable uh, areas. Uh, that are less fragile to crisis, to vulnerabilities in different uh, uh, ways, different aspects, and those in red are the most vulnerable. So we see that the blue areas are actually very few, and uh, the others are in between, and Africa uh, has quite a few challenges. In terms of women, uh, statistics of 2019, Again, uh, we see that uh, there are few areas, this time in green, are where women are most physically secure, and those in red, as they go a darker red, are, they are lacking physical security. We see again that we have a lot of work to do in order to ensure that women around the world are secure, not only in terms of livelihoods, but also physically. So, with all this happening around the world, actually we have seen from the last century and in this century that we are coming back to thinking of peace in terms of positive peace. And Linda Groff, this is um, a figure, a graph, that she made of a survey of uh, different types of theories and aspects covered by these theories. And we have gone from thinking that peace is basically the absence of war or maybe the balance of uh, forces uh, among states, nation states or empires, hmm? deterrence, etc., to think about structural uh, violence or the lack of it, uh, also feminist theory, and then going further, intercultural mediation, intercultural peace, cultural peace, and then Gaia, Vandana Shiva mentioned uh, Gaia peace uh, two days ago, and also inner, outer peace, so the inside individual and how we relate to the rest of the world, including the living um, other uh, living, um, um, how can I say, animals and the earth. And the aspects now that we cover, we discuss, are all of them, environmental, social, among states, within states, within the community, within the family, gender-wise, within the individuals. This is Galtung, Johann Galtung's uh, formula of peace, just to be brief because I have a few minutes. So Johann Galtung is considered the father of modern peace studies. 
and he uh, has managed to do a good distinction between positive peace and negative peace. Negative peace, of course, is very important, but mainly refers to the prevention of violence or diminishing, sanctioning violence against people, against minorities, against other groups, and, of course, uh, reaching wars. But positive peace is based on cooperation, and that means everything that we do to enable peace and build peace. And his formula says, so it's like a formula, where we have more equality and empathy that we are able to diminish the trauma and the conflict that we may have. We have to understand that conflict is part of life. We always have conflict. We have different points of views, different ideas, different interests, different tastes. Uh, the question is not to reach violence, so that we are able to work together, live together, and build a world in peace. So the current approaches in the study of peace, uh, I just, I'm very brief with one slide. Mainly is peace and security, so even including enterprises. So now we, there are protocols in terms of preventing uh, harming or risks in conflict areas, for example. Um, or uh, how we diminish the risk of violence or like gender violence, that's another example. Then we have a lot of publications and theories in terms of peace as management, not only in development projects, but uh, widely uh, in terms of theory of change and also what is called read small and read large. Read small is when we do good in terms of peace building, but it's not necessarily having a wider impact in the whole area or the whole country or for the long term. And with large is the latter. And then we have peace as a large business. Uh, we have a lot of um, now uh, institutions uh, talking about positive peace. We have the UN Global Compact for Peace. We have also uh, businesses uh, peace awards. And w there is also many publications talking that commerce uh, brings about peace as well. However, we have uh, great disconnects and uh, most of the publications and research actually speak out that peace building, uh, we talk a lot about what, like theory of change, how we change things, how we achieve the targets, but we are not talking about who is doing it and how we are achieving that. Also, peace building as an activity, but not that it's a systemic change and we have to be working on so many aspects at the same time that they are linked among themselves. And then peace building as uh, uh, social responsibility, but not really valuing local ownership, where cooperatives appear very highly. So where do cooperatives appear in all that? Uh, basically, the first thing is that they appear in post-war, post-conflict transitions. So in terms of rebuilding, de-escalation, demobilization, restarting agriculture, restarting credit, restarting the economy. And that's, of course, wonderful and very, very important. But there are many PhD theses now, MA theses, and some publications, for example, from UNRIST, that are telling us also other parts that we are seeing less, like an iceberg. Huh? And uh, we are seeing that cooperatives also contribute to enhance the protection uh, of women, individuals, groups, the community, that the people are able to situate themselves and have more dignity and therefore have their capabilities enhanced and take initiatives in their own lives and together, and also peace building as resilient life so that they are able to, like, they feel in their communities uh, safer and they work together. And actually, like cooperatives, uh, we should not take this as a perfect uh, paradise kind of thing. Huh? I'm not saying that. But I will, so mainly as community development. But it goes much more beyond that. I will give you very briefly three examples um, that do not fall into what we see in theory or when we talk of cooperatives in general. For example, here, it will be said later uh, more, with more details, many cooperatives, and in particular of women, have brought together the two sides of the genocide, of the conflict. So, and those people worked together and they have rebuilt their humanity, their uh, 
capacity to see each other in the eyes and to work together to leave behind the hatred. And that's absolutely amazing. When I went to visit Sri Lanka, they told me that in 2009, when the uh, conflict uh, finished in the north, they went immediately to visit the north to see what they could do to help, also with other uh, cooperative agencies, for example, from Nordic countries. And they found out that the only buildings standing were cooperatives. And the people were telling them that neither side wanted to destroy them because it was the only place where they could meet and the only place where they could, books, they could get books from the outside during the conflict. Again, there is the former UNRIS director who has a publication on Nicaragua who published that uh, the cooperatives in Nicaragua during the conflict, the people were fighting each other outside and they were going back into the cooperative and working together, which is again like, how can this be possible? So this is telling us that cooperatives sometimes is much more than just an economic space. It's a, a space for life and to rehumanize ourselves. In other uh, research, I have found that cooperatives actually uh, take different, uh, contribute in different ways uh, in different uh, cycles of uh, crisis. So when you have a shock, a crisis, which can be environmental, uh, can be a natural uh, shock like a tsunami or uh, can be a, a war. Then you have cooperatives who ha make great donations, provide great help like direct uh, aid, like humanitarian aid, but also advice uh, and help coping with the shock. And then others are the same help in recovery, in integrating the shock uh, into the, their daily experience and provide services like health services, education, social, skills training uh, and jobs. As I said before, like restarting agriculture, restarting credit and so on. All along they do networking, not only among themselves but also with the public authorities, with NGOs, with also other businesses in the area. Uh, they restart or they build, uh, participate in value chains, dialogues, policy dialogues uh, and cultural mediation. And then, of course, they start and they go on on building sustainable livelihoods, so assets uh, in the community, market access, bargaining power, lowering the costs, and uh, building sustainable livelihoods in every sector that is possible there in that particular region. And then they also help to prepare for the next shock or the next, next uh, crisis in terms of insurance, microcredit, risk transfer, and so on. In my interviews, for example, in Rwanda, I have found that the cooperatives here are doing sometimes all of that together. But it will be explained more later in details by the Rwandan speakers. How do they do that? So beyond the economic contributions, because Galtung speaks empathy and equality, but let's say, how can I... Um, translate that uh, into rebuilding, going from fear, where you cannot even move and cooperate with each other, to reach the stage in which you uh, create cooperatives, you create wealth, general wealth, and then also inclusion for all. And what I found is that empathy is a rational process of understanding the other, so it's not emotion, it's really grasping the situation of the other and that the other is a human being like you. And because of that, you begin to understand you have common problems and common needs. And therefore, you begin to build an agency path by which you are able to act upon your own life and your opportunities and then reaching cooperation and building cooperatives. On the other side, equality, how do we build equality? We, let's say, those people start from nothing, from fear, from losing everything sometimes, having a possibility to situate themselves again. From there, they can envisage how to, let's say, the possibility of empowerment. 
and then they can raise their voices together. So these two things go together, and by raising their capacity to act together because they see common needs and common aspirations, they are also capable of requesting and building equality together. That is the way to build positive peace and also inclusion. And then, of course, you have from the macro level is very important and the government level to have a general vision that upholds that, that favors and promotes that, and also with policy that is in the long term. I will end with this um, uh, slide. It's open to discussion. Uh, nowadays, they are trying to come up with indicators for positive peace. This is more like a statistical uh, approach, and uh, it's new. Uh, so it's, uh, this is from a report of 2018. Um, but what it means is that those points that you see together, the blue points together, these are pairwise frequency-related uh, indicators. That means that when one is moving, the others are moving. When one is moving faster, the others are also moving faster. I will mention just a few of them. I don't know if you can read them on the screen, like GDP per capita, uh, the business environment, of course, also for cooperatives, uh, inequality adjusted to life expectancy, gender inequality, uh, youth development, poverty gap, control of corruption, uh, etc. So those are the blue points that are closer to each other, which means there is no trickling down, trickle down benefits. This is raising up at the same time. This is what the peace, positive peace index is showing us. When one of these indicators is moving up, it's levering the others up as well. And I think cooperatives can contribute, therefore, to positive peace uh, in a significant and very important way. And if we go back to the beginning, where we find that we have so many areas in the world in conflict with repeated cycles of violence, I think we all need to contribute and to think further how we can do that now and for the long term. Thank you. Wow. Um. So I was thinking all the way along of how closely this interrelates to the discussion with Dr. Vandana Shiva earlier in the week, the idea that human beings are connected into the environment within which we exist, and that environment can be positive or negative depending upon how well those human beings collaborate and cooperate. Um, I'd also mention that this idea of equality and empathy in the discussion of positive peace relates very specifically to the cooperative model because we know that trust and reciprocity are, the, are fundamentally foundations of the cooperative model. You don't build trust without empathy, and you certainly can't have reciprocal relationships without empathy. So um, thank you very much, Claudia, for setting the stage for us. Um, really, really interesting. I was also thinking, wouldn't it be great if each of us could internalize that and be able to talk about it within our environments? Uh, and the other thing I was thinking of was I, I could imagine an entire course in, in a college curriculum focused not just on the, the theory but also on the, the examples and the, the research that's being done around the world. So thank you again. Our second speaker is Jean-Louis Bancel, my friend Jean-Louis, who is chairman of Crédit Coopératif in France. Uh, he came to Crédit Coopératif as a vice chair before moving in as chair. And before that, he was with the National Federation of French Mutual Organizations. He is the president of Cooperatives Europe and on the ICA Global Board, uh, has a PhD in law, and um, is going to be speaking en français. So uh, please welcome Jean-Louis Bancel. Good morning, everyone. As Martin just told you, I will try and show you 
uh, how it is interesting to have uh, language diversity in order to be able to build a better world. Thank you so much, Claudia, for your presentation. And as a chair of Cooperative Europe, I will try and continue on the path that Claudia has set for us this morning. I am not here as a researcher, however. I am here to uh, tell you about uh, what has been done by Cooperative Europe within the framework uh, of the uh, multi-annual framework partnership agreement with the European uh, Commission. And more uh, globally, I shall extend uh, uh, my reflection uh, on the international issue of peace. The very first thing, obviously, that comes to our mind when we come to Rwanda uh, are the difficulties that uh, Rwanda has been facing after the genocide. Uh, Claudia was uh, actually thinking about uh, talking about it, but when with uh, President Ariel Guaco we went to the memorial to pay tribute uh, to the victims of uh, the genocide, uh, um, so there was a plaque that said that Rwanda started by setting the basis of a peaceful future by uh, enabling everyone to have access to education, health, for the empowerment of women and the creation of cooperatives. So this is what has been developed uh, on a local level. I would like to let you know that Cooperatives Europe has uh, recently published a study called Cooperate Event Peace, Strengthening Cooperate Democracy, Participation and Trust. This report has showcases 20 case studies from over 14 countries. Uh, Colombia, for instance, Uganda, Syria, to name but a few. And would really like to give you one example on the American f continent. We were able to show how in Salvador cooperatives have been able to contribute to the good use of common natural goods as a way to reduce tension within their communities. Claudia, you said it. Uh, I will not uh, dwell on that. But cooperatives really contribute to the setting of a peaceful environment. And this is more of a conceptual tradition, but uh, whereas uh, peace is uh, positive or not, in French we rather talk about uh, the word concord, concordium. Uh, we are in a country, at least in France, uh, that has uh, known during the French Revolution episodes that were very close to civil war phenomenons, even if obviously history books will never tell you about that in these terms. Uh, but in the French conception of peace and peacefulness, uh, the term Concord in French would rather apply to inner peace within the borders of a country, whereas there was peace would be more of an international uh, accept. Uh, we will come back uh, to that later when we talk about uh, the international side of the cooperative movement. Claudia, what you said is amazing. On the other hand, let's not uh, be mistaken when we interpret what you have said. You have shown us the work of a researcher. We should not deduce from this that cooperatives uh, are the only ones that are capable to solve all problems by themselves. And I would like to tell you more about that uh, by uh, telling you exactly how much academic research can actually bring to us, but also that sometimes uh, um, the results of this research can be quite limited. A few days ago, the Nobel Prize uh, for Economy has been attributed to Michael Kramer, Ajit Benjamar, and Esther Duflo, uh, a woman. It's the second time a woman gets, has been awarded the Nobel Prize of uh, Economy. 
after a great American economist. But this time we have Esther Duplo. She is a French researcher, and she has been awarded the um, Nobel Prize for Economy. And she was has been working on poverty. So you see, there is a link between uh, all the these factors, because there are indeed many factors that can contribute to lifting people out of poverty. So these researchers have seen uh, their work contested and questioned by other searchers, because uh, they like to do that, you know, between researchers, they like to question each other's works and each other's results. But they've shown that when we send children to school, it would be better if they uh, didn't have an empty stomach and they would probably be learning much better if they had something to eat. That's not that scientific, is it? It just shows that poverty, just as much as peace, depends on so many different factors. Sometimes we think that something that looks like a mere correlation can actually become a cause and effect um, System And I think here lies the strengths of intellectual analysis. Obviously, um, you who are here today, members of uh, the international cooperative movements, will never forget that cooperatives are first and foremost human enterprises. And everything that Claudia has presented to us today uh, shows that, that things cannot be done in a minute or in a day, you know, because quite obviously, uh, just because the cooperatives are born every day and everywhere, all the problems of humanity will be solved. But cooperatives can definitely contribute to a general improvement, but they can only do that if they are within a favorable national environment. Cooperatives need to exist within the framework of a state of law. Let's not forget that cooperatives are, uh, in the end, field workers that uh, translate the ideas behind the cooperative movements into action. That is what cooperatives need. But also, cooperatives need that everyone respects the law. They also obviously need to respect the law themselves, but they also need for democracy to be respected in their environment. So I believe that the first thing that we need is a proper environment, and that this environment enables us to move forward. So what I really wanted to highlight is the symbiosis that exists between cooperative and their environment. There is an interaction between the environment and the cooperatives. There is not a cause and effect. Um, it, is, it goes well beyond that. Let me remind you that the declaration that was adopted on uh, cooperative identity, which was adopted in Manchester in 1994, lies down for the very first time the idea of cooperative values. And here, and, uh, Martin, you are the president of the Cooperative Identity Committee. Let me uh, remind you of these values. Democracy, self-responsibility, self-help, equality, equity, and solidarity. So I really wanted to remind you of this uh, first step, because after what we have heard from Claudia, I really wanted to show you that cooperatives are actually the craftsmen, and I really want to use that word, of civil understanding and peace. But obviously, uh, there are many other factors uh, that they need to thrive. Let me change scale here. I would like to move on to a global scale. It is not uh, by chance that the theme, the theme of this uh, conference has been chosen. Our board wanted us uh, to remind everyone that if we are here today, it is because we are citizens of the world. And I would like to um, share a few words uh, on um, this aspect of the cooperative world. Obviously, the cooperative movement carries a specific vision of the world, a vision of mutual understanding, 
May I remind you that uh, the 2012 slogan for the cooperative movement by the UN was Enterprises for a Better World. And this is to remind you that cooperatives walk on two legs. Let's not forget that. The business leg, if you want, but also the value leg. So let's not forget how and why the cooperative movement has, uh, uh, before World War I, uh, been committed towards uh, um, peacefulness. I would like to remind you that the Cooperative Alliance was founded in 1895. Uh, Back then, we were talking about the very first globalization. And back then, within European nations, was a real, true will to move towards modernity. And uh, so tensions uh, started to appear that uh, culminated with the world conflict of 1914. But back then, already, people beyond borders wanted to show that human community was there and didn't need borders to thrive. And so many debates started back then. Can you be an internationalist without respecting national values and nationalism? What has World War I shown us? It has shown us that we can be an internationalist while still being a nationalist. World War I started in 1914, and in every single country, cooperatives still um, gave their communities what they needed. But at the same time, nationalism has not disappeared. And I wanted to insist on that because today many people question globalization. Many people are trying to make us believe that because we are still internationalists today, we do not love our own nation anymore. This is so wrong. And this is why I wanted to tell you that being an internationalist is first and foremost recognizing the place of our own nation within a wider international global framework. And I'm telling you this because today chauvinist nationalism are um, being born again every day. And when I said chauvinism, it's not about recognizing your own nation. It's saying that your own nation is superior to every other nation and needs to dominate them all. So I think having this debate is quite important. And let's try not to reduce this debate to the to a, a local setting. Obviously, uh, the local setting is important, but we have seen after World War II uh, that uh, things could change. We were convinced that things could change. But today, uh, things are being questioned again. And this is uh, what I really, uh, why I wanted to share with you what has been said in 1920, a hundred years ago at the Basel countries. Back then, they established 17 objectives. I am not going through those uh, objectives, but the very last of these 17 objectives was to make of ICA an efficient society of nations. I think we are dwarves on the backs of giants. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Louis. Um, it's uh, my organization working on electrification uh, on the cooperative model in El Salvador and Nicaragua during the civil wars in both countries had a rather unique experience, and that is that regardless of which side happened upon the work that the line crews were doing, they would put down their weapons and help put up the utility poles uh, because they wanted to make sure that that cooperative survived the Civil War, which it did. Uh, many interesting things that Jean-Louis has added to the, the conversation, and I'd particularly like us to think about that word internationalist. Uh, we know that Globalist and globalization as words are under attack to some extent, but uh, the reminder that we are here because we are, in fact, internationalists, uh, very much committed to a better earth, a better world, 
um, is, is a really great reminder. Our next speaker is going to come at this discussion from the grassroots and from Rwanda. His name is James Karangwa, and he is currently an investment manager at a rice growing co-op, uh, Copo Riz, and is a member of that cooperative as well uh, and was involved in its founding. He has a bachelor's degree in business management and finance and banking, working on an MBA now in supply chain and logistics management. And that is a subject he's going to bring to the table here to talk about how, how that local activity interrelates to our specific topic of peace and equality. So please welcome James Karangwa. I'm James Karangwa, and I think I have a, a presentation. So the next. the cooperative is called Koporolin Hende, as you can see, and my name is uh, Karangwa James, as I can see. Uh, the cooperative is a rice cooperative and is a primary cooperative. Now the cooperative is, uh, it, it is having uh, the structure which is almost the same like other cooperatives, but uh, I want to mention that the cooperative, as the cooperative grows bigger, we decided to to invest in other businesses, and this is why you can see the structures as big as, as it is, and maybe it will continue to be big because we have uh, now two departments. Initially, we started as a rice cooperative, and later we diversified in other business, and now it caused us to put another department, and at the top are the General Assembly, good, uh, Board of Governors, the manager and the departments. Now these are our vision and mission. Our vision is to provide affordable quality and quantitative rice to local, region and global market. Our mission is unite and empower members for financial independence and economic stability. Our values, uh, quality of products and services. First of all, rice and other business that we have diversified in. Passion to serve, leading for a better future. Now this is a, a brief history to the cooperative. Kupuruli Nendi is a a rice farming cooperative operating in Eastern Province, which is the Negatsubo district of Rwanda. It started in 2003 and registered in 2005 uh, as a recognized cooperative according to the law of Rwanda. It was having, when it, when it started, it was having a uh, only five, six members, of which 394 was men, and women was 166, and we were having only 180 hectares of land where we used to produce rice. Currently, the cooperative has 3,761 members, Men, the number of men is 2,450, and women, 1,311. Member families are 12,811. These are the members, member families of our, our, our members, of course, but our members are three. 
So we have increased the, num uh, the, the, the hectares we are cultivating on now because we are having 900 hectares of which only 600 are being used to produce rice. The remaining three we are just using uh, to cultivate on other selected uh, crops like maize and beans. Of course, it was due to the, it was uh, a fund from the government that came into existence and uh, enlarged the land by building infrastructures like two dams we are using to irrigate the marshland. Now, the member share when we started, it was 3,731 francs. It was a little money. But by increasing the activities we are doing, the assets increase, uh, increase the value, and this caused the increase of the member share of a person. Whoever gets in with 3,000, now if he or she wants to, to quit, he has to be given such amount, which is uh, 1,000, 16,000. And maybe by the resolutions of the General Assembly, which is coming in this, uh, I think it will be on 28th, we suggest the capital share to increase because we have added more other assets. Now, you have seen that the number is quite big, although it is not uh, like other presentations of, of other cooperative we had yesterday. So to manage these people, members of ours, we classified our members into five grades based on agricultural seasons. In fact, this is meant to know better our members' lives so that we can cater for themselves. This is how we grade them. Uh, whoever earns 3,100 francs plus, we classify him or her in the grade one, which is better off. And maybe to jump on uh, grade five, who is uh, worse off, can harvest at a season that amount of money. I want to, to insist on, on why we are grading these people or these members of ours. It shows us that approximately 80% of members of Kupurulina are ranking from number one to three, grade one to three, uh, according to the income, and that's considered better off. And 20% of our members are worse off. Uh, now grading of members helps the cooperative to allocate the scarce resources we are having. It helps, it helps us to know which projects or what projects can we invest in or to pull up the other members from grade five to grade two or to grade one. It helps the cooperative to cater for the daily lives of uh, or problems that uh, one of the members can encounter. Now, basing on the grades we have graded to our people and uh, the data, databases we are using to know the problems of them, there are some of the services that are rendered to them. First of all, we offer transport services. I want to show you that once we started the cooperative in 2005, six, seven, members used to carry their produce on their heads or on bicycles. There was no motorcycles and what. From the field to the dry yards and even to the market, they were using bicycles. So to find a solution to that problem, we decided to buy trucks of the cooperative, as you can see, just to solve the problem of carrying the produce on head or the, the back. But again, this is, it is acting as an investment to the cooperative because we are now using the trucks to earn income to the cooperative apart from carrying, uh, providing as a service to our members. 
transport uh, services are like that. We have a big marshland of nine hectares, nine hundred hectares, as I, I said. And uh, to collect the produce from the field, from the farmers up to the market, we use our trucks, and this is uh, somehow economical. It is not costly. We offer agricultural services. When we start, when we started the cooperative, we may find that someone is just cultivating using his or her own funds, which is also limited. And at the end, he could harvest very little, which is uh, not compared, which is less compared to what he has put in. Now the cooperative decided to offer these services. Most of them are appropriate techniques of modern farming. We pay agronomists, by now we have four agronomists and other advisors who are 15 in number to be with the members at the field each and every day so that one can get improved produce, which is his or her income. And as uh, the, the choice of uh, best seeds, we we multiply seeds for our members, and even we use it to sell to other cooperatives, which is rice cooperatives. We have a license from one agricultural board that we are good seed multipliers of rice. Others is to services like using fertilizers and chemicals, of course, for pest management, and looking for better fertilizers to use as uh, we, we, we all know that we have uh, problems of these uh, fertilizers and chemicals. So these are some of the photos that we use and we are being funded by the FFS which is uh, from FAO that we have farm field schools where we coach our members for better practices to come up with uh, high productivity. Agricultural services continues, chemical and pest management, I said that. Uh, it was a bit a problem when we started, but we made a challenge for, 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 for now. Other cooperatives are coming to study how we manage to use, the, to, to use this uh, system. We trained only 75 operators who are able to, to spray the whole marshland of 600 hectares five, only, only in five days. This practice helped the cooperative to, to reduce operational costs, of course, and mitigate risks associated with chemical uh, pesticides on the health of our members. Initially, when we started, someone could cater for he, him or herself on her plot. It was so costly. It was so costly because one plot only one person who is energetic to spray uh, these chemicals on the, uh, over the plot was uh, you, 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 have, you, you have to pay, we are paying just a, a thousand. But when we come up with this system, the cost reduced, whereby one only contributes 300,000, because the one that is spraying will spray very many plots and get a lot of money, and one will pay a litre. It is also a cooperative in a cooperative. So these are some of the photos of the operators who are doing the same and we have said that it reduced uh, risks. You may find that at first one could come at the cooperative, take the chemical, maybe one day keep at home. It was risky so that young children like babies can take and maybe die for the case. But chemicals are being kept at the cooperative and these guys get from the cooperative direct to the field, finish, and the case is over. We also offer welfare services. We have a shop which is catering to our members only because they come with their cards. We have cards that all of the members have their cards, 
so others are not allowed to buy in our shop because it is somehow cheap compared to other markets and shops. So we buy them in Baruke because we are able to go to the factory and buy without intermediates. So this we repay this to our members, which is less, and even the cooperative gains. We offer also social services. By doing this, we managed to, uh, to create a fund within the cooperative, which is quite different from the cooperative. But this is a good fund. I advise you, uh, those who are not having this fund, they may tell you some of the services that we offer from this fund. Here is insurance to all members. Our members, if our country has a policy for this to all the citizens of the country, which is called Mituel Gosante, but our members are being paid by the cooperative with their families. As I showed you that member families are over 13,000. This service, for them, they pay later because it is somehow still in, uh, build, building the, the, the fund. But even if someone is just planting for the first season and in the month of May, you will have to pay the amount to all the families. After the harvest, in six months, they pay. We pay pension to editors who started the cooperative, whoever gets 70 years and above, start to come, although it is still little, but we are planning to increase. You now the cooperative started earlier, in 15, uh, it is almost 15 years, it was started by the people who are somehow old, and now they are getting old. Now we decided to keep these elders because they did something which is good to us. We pay school fees. We also pay federal services. Our, our, our member families, we can get trouble and lose a person, maybe lose a person. Our member can die. We also offer those services and they are not refundable. Like an example, okay, okay. we have uh, statistical data that from six, uh, 216, in the members who are 3761, um, 30 members died. Now, when, mem when our member dies, the cooperative through that fund provided a thousand, a thousand, a hundred thousand to the rest of the family to cater for the federal services and other activities needed. Yeah. If yeah. one is, is a member of the family, not, a, not our member, we pay only 50. And we want to increase this because it is good to our members. So these are some of the services that we offer, and it is to support the government program of the government. We diversify, as I say, to other businesses, like we are having poultry farm to empower our members, and we are having a hotel. This is a two-star hotel. To, to make other businesses, we first see what is better to the government, what is needed uh, to the government. In our government of Rwanda, we insist much on, we invested much in hospitality industry. That's why we decided to build a hotel, and it is good. These are the certificates to the hotel. Now, the, uh, the poultry keeping. Okay. We have given, we have been given awards, and this is a, motivate, a motivating factor. One of the awards are from national level. You can see members celebrating, and this is a motivating factor to our members. Now, before I conclude, I want to tell some remarks to our members, members of this uh, conference, that cooperatives are good to development, but the cooperative development lies in the hands of leaders. When the cooperative has unfair leaders, it can't be 
developed. It depends upon the decision of leaders to, 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 to plan accordingly. If you plan for fail, you fail. If you plan for development, you develop. Almost 80% of what hinders the cooperative is the conflicts that are arising from the members who are currently leading the cooperatives and the members who, who are leading the, was leading the cooperative. For us, we catered for that. We decided to establish a platform which is composed of the people that once led the cooperative, like myself. I was one, I was a chairman, the first chairman of this cooperative. But by now I'm working with the cooperative, I'm contributing. You may find other cooperatives, when one is, the term is over, is now neglected, that does cause a conflict. So leading cooperatives is left for elders. I insist on younger people to come and lead the cooperatives like our cooperative, all the younger people, and combine their efforts with older people to read the cooperative. That's why it is growing. Also hiring people. Uh, you may find that other cooperatives is not a priority, but when you ask them why are you not employing people, they always insist that we don't have money. You may find the cooperative is existing 20 years, they don't have employees. I always tell them that when you are not employing people, you will not get money. Because people are the ones that mobilizing resources, not resources mobilizing people. Now, I want to end up by, by insisting on what is training and uh, education. Many cooperatives are not training their, their, their members. You may find that trainings are revolving on the same people all over the year and this cause uh, them not to contribute equally. Because someone, if he is not informed, he will, con he will not contribute. Now, this is the secret behind our, our, our development, and I don't want to take much of it because uh, transparency, democracy, accountability trainings, this is one of, of, the, uh, of the principles that also guide the cooperative. Uh, I want to end up by telling the officials of the government that the cooperatives is the main path to development, food security, gender balance, and all the things we have closed off. So, my fellow friends, thank you for listening, and thank you. May God bless you. Thank you so much, James, for that very down-to-earth practical example of how this really works. Think of the range of services in such a short period of time that they've put together, cradle to grave. The Rochdale pioneers would be proud, so congratulations. Our next speaker is Om Devi Mala from Nepal. Given that uh, Claudia talked earlier about internal peace and harmony, how could we not have someone from Nepal on the program? Namaste. Uh, she is uh, the Nepalese board member from, on the ICA Global Board, is vice chair of the National Cooperative Federation of Nepal. She is a former member of the parliament, has a master's degree in sociology, and a diploma in co -op edu cooperative education and management from NCCE in New Delhi. So a very, very interesting person and a great person to be, to share the board seat with. Please welcome Om Devi Mala. Good morning, everybody. Namaste and a muda ho. I'm not also, I'm not also uh, uh, here, uh, I'm not also a resourcer here, just uh, coming here to speak about peace and equality with role of cooperative before and after conflict in Nepal. Mr. Chair and all speakers and all diff uh, colleagues or cooperative colleagues from different countries. Understanding the peace, 
The importance of peace has been given with high priority in all sectors of Nepalese society and culture. High priority, please, culture, peace, uh, priority in our culture, and peace is a most essential condition for the development of community, society, and nation. Development activities of physical infrastructure were all crossed during the conflict of Nepal. So there was a frozen situation of development during that period. It is most to increase the investment in education, health and infrastructure facilities and boost the awareness of people and empower them to keep stable peace. Development activities directly support to enhance the peace so that investment in peace is the investment on the development of physical infrastructure and human capital. Identity of income and opportunity together with poverty in political suppression are regarded as the root cause of conflict. In Nepal, the Maoist and Rebellions group started armed struggle for about 10 years during 1996 to 2006 to capture political power of the ruling government and establish their own political system. It is also said that feudal social structure in which allied domination socio-political suppression on equal distribution of opportunity and resources on employment, exploitation, and poverty fuel the conflict. The conflict in Nepal brought huge loss to life and poverty the people. In that period, more than 16,000 people were killed and affected the life of 450,000 family members. 5,800 people were disabled. 71,200 people were displaced internally. 25,000 children were orphaned and 9,000 women are windowed. Besides this, 1,350 persons were disappeared. 11,000 people lost their properties, several government offices, a school, bridges, and police police unit were damaged, but there was no any harm in cooperative. However, however, the conflict was settled in negotiation and resilience entered into the domestic democratic political system with the agreement to the change country from democratic Repub kingdom of republic. The 12-point peace accord between the rebellion political parties and the government of Nepal indeed the country indeed the conflict formally. This is an example of peace process of the world from Nepal that no external that no any external negotiator required for a whole peace agreement. Nepalese people themselves and the political leaders played the crucial role for landing the blood cell turmoil to the peace process. In my view, it proved that people of Nepal, birthplace of Lord Buddha, are the honest followers of peace. This peace accord finally uprooted monarchical system and established federal democratic republic political system in Nepal. The peace accord laid the foundation for inclusive and accountable democracy. As a result, inclusive the participation of women, marginalized group, and scheduled caste in the political system is the common commitment of all parties to settle down the issues of conflict interim constitution of Nepal 2007 was declared which reserved 33% seat for women representation in the legislative parliament. Nepal is Nepal stand on the 14th position globally to send the women leaders in the parliament. The constitution of Nepal 2015 has further envisioned 
the inclusive development of the country by ensuring equality between male and female, giving privilege to the marginalized group and indigenous people. Currently in Nepal, enjoying peace, aiming at achieving the prosperity through the three-pillar economic system of development, public, private, and cooperative. The active role played by the cooperative during that conflict was also recognized by the state constitution as cooperative is the three pillar of national economic in development of Nepal. And on equal distribution of productivity assets, resources, and opportunity put pressure for enhance, changing the economic role of the game and to introduce new agent of economic activities. This is why cooperatives are immersed as the building block of Nepal's economic for overcoming the socio-economic differences. Another point, role of cooperative for maintaining the peace and equality. The cooperative by virtue of its tradition and the exacting norms and values develop the feeling of owners through the integration of people in the society. It encourages to ex exercise the participatory democracy, being socially accountable towards the member. In the time of armed conflict, Nepalese cooperatives significantly contributed to the peace and equality without being affected. They, co they operated through that capital mobilization, creation of financial accessibility, and fulfillment of the create need of the people at local level. Therefore, cooperatives have been trusted by the marginalized, weak, and vulnerable people of our society, their socioeconomic environment. These cooperatives were involved in diverse phases of the economy, including agriculture and fisheries, dairy, manufacturing, financial service, communication, energy, education, health, transportation, tourism, consumer service, and so on. Cooperative as an economic enterprise work for the livelihood and employment with the organized efforts. Moreover, it has created an environment to the common people to escape from the conflict and from the exploitation of their landlords. During that insurgency period, many banks from the rural area were closed down and flew back to the urban area. However, cooperative continued their service without any disturbances. They were managed by the local leaders and community people, so they were not much affected by the rebellions and were able to create harmony among the people, which ultimately contributed for building sustainable peace in the society. At the same time, cooperative ensured the women's participation of different scope of life. Many cooperatives in different districts regularly conduct a right-based awareness program against the social evils like women and trafficking, women and girls trafficking, sexual exploitation, yearly and forceful marriage, domestic, uh, domestic works, etc. At last, all these economic development, social justice, and inclusive activities ultimately contributed to the sustainable peace in the society. The Nepalese cooperative have more than 51% women in around 6.4 million members, more than 39% female in the total 247,000 in the leadership level, and more than 48% women employees in the total 60,000 employment in the cooperative. The cooperative have been playing the role of enhancing women leadership and lifelong learning platform for their empowerment. This uh, increase the participation of women and marginalized people in political policy and decision making with equal food. 
Today, after a new constitution, many district level and central level cooperative leaders were elected at local and state level positions like mayor, deputy mayor, state MPs in the election held in 2017. This became possible in Nepal because they work with local population through cooperative before and after conflict. Due to the appreciable working of cooperative during conflict, the National Planning Commission of Nepal has started including cooperative in the chapter chapter of 12th National Plan. It is, it is considered as milestone for the planet development of the cooperative. This proved that the equality has been adopted in all sectors of Nepal for the sustainable peace in moving forward, the achieving the SDG through cooperative and other stakeholders. Thank you for all for listening me. Long life cooperative. Thank you. We had discussed the subject of peace and equality uh, some time back in our boardroom with the ICA. And after a break, uh, or during a break, uh, Om Devi came up to me and started telling the story about the Maoist insurgency and the role of cooperatives uh, pre- and post-conflict. And I said, you've got to tell your story. And she certainly has. Very, very well done. Our final speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce her. Uh, and. It's going to be a very interesting wrap-up uh, of, of this discussion. Dr. Monique Sanzabaganwa is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Rwanda, which is the central bank, which is a very important position. Prior to her becoming Deputy Governor, which happened in 2011, she was the Minister of Trade and Industry for the government of Rwanda. That included the cooperative responsibility. So she has a direct background in terms of the relationship between government and cooperatives as private sector. Prior to that, she was Minister of Finance, or she was in the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Uh, she is chair of the National Institute of Statistics since 2012. She's a fellow of the John F. Kennedy School of Government Affairs uh, and Public Financial Management. She's a fellow of the African Leadership Initiative in East Africa a fellow of the Aspen Global Leadership Network, very important global leadership think tank, and a member of the African Leaders Network. So a very credentialed and distinguished person with a PhD in economics, and we look very much forward to hearing Monique uh, speak. So please give a cooperative family welcome to Dr. Monique Sansabaganwa. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rwanda for those who are here visiting us from other countries. Um, I'm happy to be back home to the cooperative movement or community. But I must also say that as I will speak to the fact. As a regulator of the financial sector, we also have a nice story to tell uh, from financial cooperatives as well. Um, my, um, mine is going to be uh, sharing some reflection uh, from the story Rwanda has to tell uh, as one country that has also experienced uh, not just conflict, but a genocide. And um, I'll have uh, three main points to make, uh, or three main parts of my uh, contribution. The first one is going to be uh, what I think about um, this assertion uh, of, on the co contribution of cooperatives to peace and equality. Then I will share the Rwandan case, um, some highlights uh, taken from our experience, and as I conclude, I will also make some suggestions 
as to how we can even harness this contribution uh, further. On uh, my uh, first point, uh, there is surely no doubt that uh, cooperatives are very important and the cooperative model is pro-peace and pro-equality as it is built on uh, principles such as inclusion, uh, social cohesion, shared opportunity, collective uh, knowledge and effort, and many, many others. And we all know that um, in cooperatives, people focus on production, like corporate uh, testimony has um, uh, put it. Uh, and as such, they have last, less time left to unconstructive engagements. Uh, as uh, Jean-Louis said, we all are the citizens of the world and uh, we have a responsibility uh, and a contribution uh, to make. And when we know that ending violence and sustaining peace uh, is a major challenge of our time, especially uh, when you look at the numbers. Uh, the experience shows that 50% of post-war countries will collapse back into conflict in the first decade after the end of the conflict. And this is a huge challenge. How can we prevent conflicts? How can we uh, have lasting positive peace? How can we sustain and maintain peace? Of course, I will agree with the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres saying that, and I quote, cooperatives in different parts of the world have effectively contributed to peace building in a positive fashion by raising equality, empathy, trust, and inclusion." End of quote. When we talk of cooperatives, cooperation goes hand in hand with promoting peace and peace goes in hand in hand with equality. Equality is about ensuring that every individual has an equal opportunity to make the most of their lives. So surely the point is made clear and loud that uh, really the cooperative model is uh, very instrumental in sustaining peace and achieving equality. This is exactly what the Rwandan case tells us. I've mentioned that one dark uh, phase in our history was uh, a period really starting around the independence time uh, where we have had a system of political dispensation that rather encouraged uh, divisions, hatred, uh, and this culminated into a genocide against Tutsi in 1994. And when we know that the cooperative movement had re really started really here in Rwanda, even before the independence time in 1949, it actually was suffocated uh, by, by that type of system, although it, uh, it, has, it, uh, it had uh, tried to deliver uh, on, uh, on, on a few, or not just few, but really deliver, especially in rural economy, uh, of, of, of the country. But uh, you would agree with me that with the genocide, the cooperative uh, movement died also. 
So it was only uh, uh, during the reconstruction uh, process of the country and uh, mainly after the year 2000 when the government seriously uh, re re refocused on the, this um, uh, model uh, mainly uh, for economic reasons but for other uh, goods or benefits as I, as I will try to elaborate. And looking at the outcomes that the country enjoys today, this is a country that is really inclusive, that uh, is uh, uh, growing its economy, it's reducing poverty. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, between 2000 uh, and 2016, poverty levels dropped by 20 percentage points to 38, and also inequality reduced. Uh, when you look at the Gini coefficient, it was at 0 0.5 in 2000 and dropped to 0 0.4 in 2016. Uh, the same trend on financial exclusion. Uh, we had, uh, in 2008, a financial exclusion of 52%, meaning 52% adult population in Rwanda was financially excluded, and this uh, dropped to 11% in 2016. And the, the, the financial cooperatives mainly the Umurenge savings and credit cooperatives had a very key role to play in these outcomes. Uh, we have agenda gaps that have declined over time and surely the cooperative model has played a significant role in these outcomes. How did it work? Today you have uh, uh, around nine 1,300 uh, cooperatives um, with a membership of above 5 million members. Of these, we have uh, 438 financial cooperatives, which include 416 Umurenge cooperatives, these Umurenge circles, Umurenge is um, an administrative entity under the district, and we have 416 such entities. And each of those has a savings and credit cooperative. And these 416 cooperatives uh, have a membership of 2.5 million adults. This is out of 6 million adult population. Uh, of which 41% are women, and they have uh, in deposits roughly uh, 80, 80 million dollars, and in outstanding loans, 50 million dollars. Um, I would also say that not so formal maybe not so formalized into cooperatives, but we have those, those uh, informal groups. And these are organized along the same principles of coming together, of solidarity, of, of helping each other. Uh, so many of them, we have actually mapped 47 of thousand of such savings groups, and a lot of things are happening there. I will tell the story of what is happening in those groups. Uh, that's where you can find really healing taking place. You can find people learning about uh, life. You can find where people are saving and, and producing and selling or providing a service. Uh, you can uh, find really many positive things happening there. And these are the future cooperatives. Uh, so we look also to that them as uh, also part of the ecosystem, although not really truly formalized. So with this landscape, I will tell what we see happening 
uh, cooperatives solving four main pain points in this country. One, the social intermediation, I call it. Um, Dr. Claudia mentioned the agency, identity, all those uh, things happening. When you have an economy or a society that is coming up, uh, out of um, a, a conflict, and in this particular case, genocide. So we are seeing a lot happening there. That it goes beyond the primary activity in corporate, for instance, is producing rice. That was the, f I mean, the main activity. In a circle, maybe it's financial intermediation. But you see more than that happening. You see solidarity. You see people coming together and uh, gaining scale. You see their voice going up. You see their negotiating power. You see they are growing smarter. You see they are playing actual leadership roles because they are uh, perceived by community members as the elite in the community, and they are really contributing to the governance of the society, to everything um, in, in government, in civil society, in, in church-based organizations, and, and really this is some um, really wealth being created there. That, that's how you call social intermediation. But also another pain point is social protection. Government has really tapped this model to, as a vehicle for key government programs on social protection. We are talking of a program targeting poverty in, 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 the, in the, the, the Umurenge, what we call Umurenge Vision 2020 Umurenge program. And this is a program targeting the poorest of the poor, including the elderly, including the disabled, and including those who, who can work but who don't have a, an opportunity. So it has an element of financial services, but also an, an element of uh, public works and an element of just a loca financial allocation. Uh, other programs such as community health insurance have been mentioned, even tool kits for the youth that is graduating from vocational training schools. Another pain point is, and this is a big one, healing and reconciliation. In our country uh, that has faced a genocide, we have really many people wounded and really struggling to, 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 uh, to really uh, come out of that, both from the side of the survivors of the genocide, but also from the side of those who were involved in committing uh, the genocide and other related crimes. So um, there is an organization I belong to called the Unity Club, and this, is, uh, this organization composed of uh, cabinet members, former and current, and their spouses. We, we partner with the National Unity and Reconciliation Commission to, to, to implement programs in peace building, and reconciliation and unity and uh, rebuilding the Rwandan identity. And the experience we have, especially with those we call Abarinzi Bijihango, these are the people, ordinary people in the community who have really done extraordinary uh, deeds in terms of really promoting unity, in terms of protecting the pact of unity among Rwandans. And we see cooperatives really in that space a great deal. For instance, we have um, uh, an initiative in the southern part of the country where we have widows, uh, really whose uh, husbands uh, were decimated during the genocide, come together uh, with other wives of the perpetrators who are in prison and come together, manage really to talk that through, manage to heal, manage to form a cooperative, manage to do stuff, and really inspire the nation. We have such uh, uh, many cooperatives around really doing that, that, that work. And in addition to the primary economic activity they are doing, actually they are even um, gaining in terms of healing and reconciliation as part of the process. Um, I would also mention the last four, uh, fourth pen point, which is orderly labor relations. And this is a huge thing. 
I can, for instance, mention a few cases. Here we have one huge financial cooperative, uh, which is mainly uh, a cooperative of uh, military forces. The CSS, it's a tremendous story. This is a huge bank. And the genesis of it is like, you have really so many um, uh, uh, people who have contributed or are still contributing or have been demobilized who have served. And you know, as a country, maybe you may not really afford uh, enough from the wage bill to, 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 to reward them. But how does the government do to deal with that situation? Really helping them to form a cooperative and save together and really achieve and grow beyond what even you could imagine. And this, there is really a very successful story here. Same model has worked for, for the teachers. We have Umgari Musako achieving the same uh, really uh, how, how you can help uh, improve livelihoods of those really who are doing noble jobs but uh, in huge numbers and y y you have to come up with an innovative solution of how to really make them come together and build that strong solidarity and put their efforts together to achieve even big, bigger outcomes. We have the same model for um, the drivers who were retrenched, you know, at some point, the government of Rwanda decided actually a zero fleet policy, whereby government doesn't run a, a, a fleet because there was a lot of wastage going on there. So many drivers were retrenched, and these have really formed a, a strong cooperative. Today, if you'd hear testimonies from those former drivers, they own their cars, actually more than one car each. They, 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 uh, the ones performing or implementing or executing even hired by government institutions with their cars today. So I can go on and on, on really how government has really managed very delicate situations on labor relations using the cooperative movement. So for me, that's positive piece. Now, to my last point, what can we suggest to do to even harness this potential more here in Rwanda, and I think this can also apply to others. One, I think since we have really evidence that these channels do work, and the people there are really people-centered kind of uh, uh, people, uh, and the initiatives and the spirit they have is, is that, that in that direction, I think we can do a lot in terms of communicating and passing on education messages. It can be on anything. For instance, as a regulator, we are, we are seeing these really and using them for financial education. But we can bundle that with so many messages on peace, on unity and reconciliation, on really uh, ownership of their lives, on uh, responsible citizenship, and so many, many other things. Uh, a second uh, thing maybe we could do even better is how to actually reinforce the linkages between the productive cooperatives and the financial cooperatives. I think there are a lot of synergies to be, to be, to be harnessed which we are not yet really optimizing on, but I think it's something we can really do achieve. Lastly, what I suggest is that we really uh, continue to build the capacity and get these cooperative values entrenched. You know, there is that risk of always new members joining, but rejoining really not knowing exactly what a cooperative model is and what they, are, they, they should, what are the responsibilities, what are the principles and the values. And we need really to keep in church, uh, getting this uh, hammered. We are seeing, like, uh, I liked what, uh, what James mentioned, of what unfair and bad leaders of cooperatives really can do in terms of destruction. 
We are seeing this in some in, in the financial cooperatives as well. The issues of governance, I think it's key. Uh, that local ownership, I think we have a lot to do there so that we, we really um, keep hammering the message that this is a really very wonderful model and it's, it, when it works well, individually people gain but also collectively gain and the country as a whole. So I wish to end it uh, at this point and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Dr. Monique. Uh, particularly that last comment reminding us about being vigilant about governance. I imagine everybody in this room has one story at least where things weren't working out very well either with the CEO or general manager or the board of directors. And that situation can turn the perception of a cooperative negative in almost one minute. Uh, and it's hard to, hard to recover from it. So thank you for that reminder. And also um, for basically bringing us full circle around the ideas of empathy, equality, and inclusion as fundamentally important to how we maintain a peaceful environment that allows all people to grow. So you've got diversity as well as equality. Equity was in there too. Sometimes we leave out equity. Equity is that everyone is at the same level. And we talked about the Gini Index, for those of you who don't know it. Uh, that's G-I-N-I. -I. That is the uh, gap between the highest wage earner and the lowest in a society. And the fact that that, is, uh, that gap is, is coming down for uh, Rwanda is a very interesting thing. So uh, unfortunately, we'll have to end at this point. But I do want to quickly uh, point out that in your program, um, you saw Pascalina Mitema, who was going to be here. Unfortunately, she was not able. Uh, but we do have the Vice Chair of the Amahoro Women's Cooperative here. If you would stand for a second to be recognized. Where are you? Thank you. Just a few words. Thanks. My name is Jean Mukaru Tawana. I represent Amahoro in Kichukiro District. Uh, in uh, Jikondo sector, in Kanserege cell, and uh, Kanserege village too. I represent, uh, I'm here on behalf of Miss Mitima Pascalin. She's sick today. Our cooperative started in 2006. It started uh, very small. We were a small association, a small group of women. We were scattered. We were working from our, you know, the, the sidewalk, from our own households. Others were uh, street hawkers, uh, you know, selling stuff on the street. So we came together as women, but we, all of us were vulnerable. We had, we were faced with many problems. We started with three products, and in 2010, we became a cooperative. And, and uh, we developed our members together. Everybody brought what they could and we exchange ideas, and that's what a cooperative is all about, exchanging ideas. Everybody knows something, so that's, that's what they bring to the table, and we build on that. That's what our cooperative did, and that's how we developed from those uh, vulnerable women Sell, carrying uh, items uh, in a basket on their head on the road. We were very vulnerable. Our, our children could not go to school. We didn't have a decent shelter. We were almost homeless. So the cooperative helped us to get together. We became one. We started working together. Everybody uh, doing what they could and we became productive. And when we became a cooperative, we set goals 
for ourselves. We said our children need to go to school. And the children had to go to school. Every member's children went to school. And uh, we put uh, our efforts together. We pulled our efforts together, our resources. We found school fees to pay for them together. All of us, widows, and uh, young girls who were orphans, they joined us. They grew up. We even, some of them are married today. Our children went to school. Some of them graduated college. Others are still at, in college. Our goal as a cooperative is we will not uh, stay... Uh, we, were, we were working from uh, a church's uh, backyard. We decided to have our own office. Today, uh, we bought our own office. We have our own house. It's our office. We no longer rent. Another goal was that every member had to be developed. So we started a saving scheme within our cooperative. And from that, uh, those savings, we could pay school fees for our children. We said no member was going to be homeless or going uh, asking a friend to, uh, to spend the night at a friend's. We decided to buy every member a house because uh, when we, we gave them a house and they would be paying back until they pay it off and then we use the same money to buy houses for every member. Everyone, every single member has a house today. So the importance of cooperative and, uh, is, is visible. It, uh, it makes you stronger. You pull your resources together it enlightens you as well. That's the importance of a cooperative. And our government knows what you are doing as a cooperative. You are no longer in the informal sector. Once the government knows you exist, they train you. And then you, 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 you move to another level. Then you get uh, training in uh, financial management. And that, that is what the, our government did. Our cooperative plays an important role in the country's economy. We have 80 products from two products. Today we pay taxes. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Sir, I'm sorry. We have to stop uh, because our time is... Uh, I, I, I apologize, but... We can talk. If you could come up here, we could talk uh, on the question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's very quickly. As quickly as possible. Yes. On occasion like this, I wouldn't pass I mean, without remembering the two uh, uh, persons, Professor Ian McPherson and Dr. Yoda Pass, who have played a big role in uh, the ICA. And the main... The main work of these people was to, to I mean, uh, the, was on peace, was built on peace. So in 19, I mean, in, in 2007, they organized a seminar in Victoria uh, University in Canada. And I just want to remind that all these things that have been mentioned here and other things that on global level are put in a book entitled The Pursuit of Cooperatives and the Pursuit of Peace. So please, take that also into consideration. Thank you very much for that reminder, and it also, it also gives me an opportunity to think about the late uh, Professor Ian McPherson at University of Victoria, who was a very, very important player in this whole discussion. So I thank you all very much. Let's have a great round of applause for our panelists who were fantastic.